So hello, I'm Shreyas Carr, and I would like to thank everyone for attending this live discussion this evening. Let me first introduce myself and our organization for those of you who are not familiar. So I'm a junior at DuPont Manual in Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm the founder and CEO of the nonprofit organization Community AI. Community AI aims to empower middle and high school students to build AI-driven projects to help the community and the environment. We provide expert and peer mentorship for students creating projects for the community, live instruction in artificial intelligence and machine learning, and aid to students in creating AI clubs in high schools throughout the US. Because of the overwhelming response, we decided to create a club here at Manual, an AI club. In both the club and community AI, we seek lessons from data scientists about their experiences and about how AI and data science in general is used to solve real world problems. Today, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Fairchild of the Los Alamos National Laboratory with us to talk about how AI is being used to tackle COVID-19. I would like to thank Dr. Fairchild on behalf of the Manual AI Club and Community AI for taking time out of his busy schedule for this live discussion. We have most of our AI Club members in attendance along with our uh, teacher sponsor, Ms. Lober, uh, and our MST coordinator, Ms. Hafel, and our advisor, Dr. Willard. In addition, we have several other students, teachers, and professionals here. I would like to thank everybody for joining this session. Please ask any questions in the chat, and the moderators will ask the question to Dr. Fairchild at the end of the talk. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to our chief advisor and mentor, Dr. Willard, who will introduce us to the distinguished speaker for today, uh, Dr. Fairchild. All right, thank you, Shreyas. So um, I think you all will, will love this talk. Um, Dr. Fairchild comes to us with a little bit different background than I do. Um, a lot of what I discussed, especially in our, our short uh, AI class was um, from a math perspective, but Dr. Fairchild comes to us from more of a, a computer science perspective. So it, um, hopefully he'll be able to give you kind of a different point of view than I've provided previously. So he has his uh, bachelor's in math and computer science from the University of Texas at Austin, and then his master's and PhD uh, in computer science from the University of Iowa. And then I met Jeff in uh, around 2012 when he joined Los Alamos National Lab as a graduate research assistant, and he's transitioned to a staff scientist now that he has his PhD. So I think that happened around 2015. Um, so he now works in the analytics, intelligence, and technology division. Um, so I, I got to be good friends with Jeff while I was out at Los Alamos. Um, in addition to being a, a great scientist, um, Dr. Fairchild's an avid snowboarder. Uh, he's a rattlesnake wrangler. Um, he's a weightlifter, and he's a, a cat lover. Um, we might get to see some in the background if he doesn't have a door shut. Um, no, it's not shut. It's very likely. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully they'll join us too. Um, under normal times, I would have loved to have Dr. Fairchild come see us uh, in person, um, but the pandemic has, has left us in kind of a weird world. Um, but once this is under control, maybe we'll have Dr. Fairchild come back and give us an update. Um, I'm sure he'll have plenty of cool things to talk about, and I can show him some of the beautiful distilleries. Uh, here in Kentucky. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it over and uh, give it to the, the main speaker tonight. Thanks a lot, Jeff. And thanks, uh, Shreyas, for that nice introduction as well. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm Jeff. I'm Jeff Fairchild. Um, uh, some, some, sometimes I'm Dr. Fairchild. Uh, at, here at Los Alamos, uh, we usually, the, I guess the running kind of joke is that everybody's got a PhD, so the doctor is kind of redundant. And so uh, we often just go by first names. So you guys are welcome to just call me Jeff, that's fine. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit today about uh, some disease uh, modeling work that, that I've been working on for quite a while now. Um, this is uh, really fun stuff and uh, hopefully you'll find it uh, kind of topical uh, given what's uh, going on right now, obviously. Uh, the way I structured the talk is uh, I have kind of a brief introduction on who I am, although Jeff did a really great job of, of giving that to you already. Uh, so I'll probably gl gloss over that. 
And then I want to talk a little bit about how traditional epidemiology is done, and then we'll kind of transition into the more modern stuff uh, that, that our team is working on. So again, uh, who am I? So as Jeff, uh, Jeff already kind of laid this out, uh, I went to uh, UT uh, for my undergrad and I went to Iowa for grad school. Uh, I've been at Los Alamos now for just over eight years. Uh, and I have a whole lot of different interests, um, primarily around data analytics and machine learning, um, activity-based intelligence. Uh, disease modeling and computational epidemiology, though, are kind of the focus of this talk. Um, underlying that is a whole bunch of different modeling um, capabilities, including machine learning, including statistical modeling, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll touch on all of it a little bit, and then we can have a nice discussion towards the end. A little bit more about who I am. Uh, I have a whole lot of interests. Uh, so I like to scuba dive. I play Dungeons and Dragons. I've played D&D uh, &D now multiple times a week for, I don't know, the last five years. Uh, I like to weightlift. Uh, I like to go hiking. Uh, in the bottom uh, middle is, is me getting engaged to my now fiance, uh, Jenna, and I go snowboarding uh, and, and so on and so forth. And of course, what presentation would be complete without a bunch of cat pictures. So we have five cats. Um, and so, uh, yeah, these, these, are, these are our cats. Uh, and it's entirely likely that one of them will make an appearance at least uh, during this presentation. All right, so a little bit about Los Alamos, because I'm not sure what you guys know. So this map shows you where Los Alamos is. So we're here in New Mexico. Uh, there are two national laboratories here in New Mexico. There's Sandia National Laboratory that's down in Albuquerque. And then uh, we at Los Alamos are about an hour and a half north of that. Um, there are a number of different Department of Energy laboratories. Uh, and you can kind of see how they're kind of spread out uh, throughout the, uh, the country here. Uh, there are three in particular that are called the weapons laboratories and those, those are the ones that are they're that highlighted in blue so there's uh, livermore that's out here that's kind of zoomed in here so there's livermore that's out uh, kind of near san francisco and then of course there's us in sandia um, it's a very pretty place we live in the mountains we live at elevation 7500 feet uh, so there's a ski hill that's about 15 minutes from my front door that's uh actually probably looking kind of like a ski hill right now, given that we just got some snow a few days ago. Um, the terrain is really pretty here. Um, nice, clean air. I don't know. I love it. If you're an outdoors person, this is kind of heaven. So it's a, it's a, great, uh, it's a great place to live. All right, let's jump into epidemiology. So how do we define what epidemiology is? So epidemiology is the study of the distribution and factors that determine health-related states or events in a population and the use of this information to control health problems. A little bit more. So what does epidemiology do? You might be familiar with this if you've been paying attention to COVID at all, um, but epidemiology is a study of populations to understand uh, causes of health and disease in a given population, monitor the health of the population, identify the determinants of health and disease in a community, and investigate and evaluate interventions uh, to prevent and maintain health. It's this last one that uh, my work often really focuses on. So uh, the field of computational epidemiology is where we attempt to use data in order to uh, model and then provide data-driven uh, actionable results or, in, or information that could enable actionable results by you know, the CDC or by your local Department of Health, for example. So we kind of work uh, across all levels of the government here. A little bit about the history of epidemiology, and I'll give a, a fun anecdote here in just a little bit. Um, so it kind of a really dates back to Hippocrates uh, back in the fourth century BCE. Uh, he is widely considered to be the father of medicine and the very first epidemiologist. Um, you may have heard of the Hippocratic Oath, and that's where that uh, comes from. Uh, it's the oath that all uh, medical doctors take when they, when they graduate from medical school. Um, 19th century, though, in the 1800s was, was when a lot of this really took off. So Louis Pasteur was the one that developed germ theory, and he is famous for uh, inventing pasteurization, which is a product that makes you know, things like milk and juice um, uh, safer to drink. Uh, Joseph Lister uh, was the first one to develop antiseptic surgery, uh, which was a big uh, advancement at the time. Um, Robert Koch was one of the founders of modern bacteriology, which is the study of bacteria. 
Um, and he was, uh, he identified organisms that cause TB, anthrax, cholera, and so, so on and so forth. He ended up winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, John Snow is a name that you might have heard about. He is the father of what we call modern epidemiology. And this is the anecdote that we'll talk about here in just a little bit. And then of course, uh, Florence Nightingale is the, the founder of modern nursing. Um, her use of uh, her use of and focus on kind of clean techniques in medicine, uh, you know, single-handedly reduced the mortality during the Crimean War from 42% down to 2%. Uh, so she was uh, just a huge influence in um, kind of epidemiology and medicine in general. And then kind of looking forward to more modern things. So the 20th century, we've shifted uh, from looking at kind of single agents uh, to determine kind of multifactorial things. And so there are, you know, so looking at, you know, what causes this particular cholera outbreak, uh, you know, it might be uh, contaminated water or something like that, to uh, what are, you know, the, what's, what kind of re reduced risk do we see when, when a population stops smoking? Right? Those are really complicated questions that require a whole lot of data. And uh, this is what a lot of the epidemiology work over the last uh, century or so has been focused on. These are large scale, long term studies. There are uh, some studies, I believe the Framingham Heart Study has been around since the 40s and it's still ongoing. So there are actually generations of people that have been a part of this one study. Um, the development of genetic and molecular techniques has also really contributed to this. You've probably heard about this a lot in the news related to COVID, where people are trying to look at how COVID, or really SARS-CoV-2, the, the, the virus that, that causes COVID, is uh, mutating throughout uh, you know, the world and throughout time. Uh, and so it's only really within the last couple decades that we're able to do that. And more specifically, probably within the last uh, decade uh, that we have the computational capabilities to really do this at scale. Uh, and a fun fact, the Human Genome Project started at Los Alamos in the mid 80s. Uh, there's a really neat uh, a report that came out of this meeting uh, from the mid 80s that I'm happy to share with you guys. Um, of course, there are new infectious diseases. Uh, I mentioned HIV and SARS here, but uh, uh, not only is there SARS, but there, you know, SARS was the coronavirus that hit us in the early 2000s. But of course, now we're dealing with uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is uh, the, the virus that causes uh, COVID. And then finally, uh, public health preparedness for bioterrorism. So that's something that's on the mind of a lot of people in government. And uh, Lano actually does a whole lot of work uh, in this space. So let's talk a little bit about uh, John Snow. I mentioned his name earlier, and I said that he's kind of the founder of modern epidemiology. And so why is that? Uh, so there was a, an outbreak of cholera, uh, a pandemic of cholera that occurred in Europe uh, from 1846 to 1860. And so, and those dates are not wrong. That was a 14 year cholera pandemic. And so I say, you think COVID-19 is bad. Imagine if you're dealing with a pandemic for 14 years. Uh, so uh, this one particular outbreak uh, in London uh, got a lot of attention. There was uh, a lot of people trying to understand why this outbreak was occurring. There were a couple, uh, uh, theories that people were floating around. One was this miasma theory, which is, you know, there's something going on in the air and people are, are breathing in this stuff in the air and then they get sick. Um, that was kind of prevailing theory at the time. And then a handful of people believed in this germ theory, which was that cholera was some germ cell that had yet to be identified and it was spreading through this cell. It wasn't some innate property in the air. Um, and many people, including London's lead medical officer, thought that this particular theory was peculiar. They didn't quite buy it. And it took people quite a while to really get into germ theory. So what did John Snow do? So what he did was he plotted all of the cases of cholera that occurred in this one area of London on a map. And I, I show you the map. This is the actual uh, map that he drew. And you can see that there are uh, kind of, you know, ticks along here where there were cases. And so along here on this broad street is right here, kind of smack in the middle. And you can see that there are a lot of cases kind of consolidated around Broad Street. And so what John Snow did was he plotted all these cases here, and then he looked at kind of what, what the common denominator was. And he found out that there was a- How much AI I can't handle it? Oh, sorry, is there a question? Okay, I think we're good. Okay, uh, so there's a pump uh, that was right kind of smack in the middle here. Uh, it's kind of, it's labeled pump. I'm not sure if you can really make that out. Um, but what he did was he showed that 
the common denominator through interviewing all of these people was that they had used this pump. So back in the day, people didn't have running water going to their houses like we do today. Back in the day, what they would have to do is go to these water pumps that were distributed throughout the city. They would fill up their buckets of water and then they take that home and that would be the water that they would use for drinking and for cleaning and whatnot. And so what he found was that uh, all the cases that uh, were experiencing cholera at this time had gone to this pump fairly recently. And so uh, he wasn't able to conclusively prove that the pump was the cause, but he did convince people that uh, through his analysis, they should, they should disable the pump. And of course, once he disabled the pump, cases stopped, which was really great. However, after this epidemic ended, the council that disabled the pump actually turned it back on uh, because to, to essentially to accept that Jon Snow's work was correct meant that his oral fecal mode of disease transmission, which is that's how the water is typically contaminated in a cholera outbreak, uh, you had to accept that that's a fact. And uh, the proper people of London at that time did not, not want to accept that fact, uh, so they turned on the pump. Later analysis, much later analysis, actually found that the pump had been dug three feet from an old cesspit that was leaking fecal bacteria. And so that's what was ultimately causing um, the, the outbreak, but they didn't know that at the time. Um, let's see. Oh, I didn't mean to leave this one quite in there. Um, sorry, so this is uh, from a slide deck that I borrowed uh, from another presentation that I gave. Um, so the what are some basic concepts in ep epidemiology so you've probably heard some of these terms so there's morbidity there's mortality there are all sorts of rates and proportions and risks um, so morbidity is uh, basically the counts of people that are getting sick from a disease mortality is the counts of people that are dying from a disease uh, so those words unfortunately sound quite similar to one another um, but they are very different and they are related in some ways but they are there are key differences there um, rates, proportions, and risks are, are big uh, common topics in epidemiology, right? And so uh, you, if you're comparing the total number of cases that, you know, Texas received against the total number of cases that Alaska, you know, uh, had, uh, you can't do that without adjusting for the population, right? And so because Texas has so many more people than Alaska does, uh, then you have to make, you have to adjust for that in your calculation. And so as a result, typically what we often talk about is cases per 100,000, or we'll talk about percentages uh, in epidemiology. And that, that's really key to being able to compare different geographic regions. Uh, we have measures of incidence, which is occurrence of new diseases or uh, new, uh, uh, new disease or injury in a population. Uh, and if that's always over some specified period of time. And so as an example, um, we would be looking at COVID and we would say that, you know, the incidence of COVID uh, would be, uh, you know, we have, you know, six million cases over the last six months or something like that. That's kind of what uh, we look for for incidence. Um, prevalence is a big thing as well, and that, that typically discusses some existing long-term disease. And so if you have uh, HIV, for example, you might be talking about prevalence there, where you have some, some uh, continuous population of people that often have that disease. And so uh, just kind of a recap, so incidence measures new cases and prevalence measures existing cases. And I've got some examples over here. I'm not going to go through them right now, but there's ways that you can calculate all these things. Uh, and, and specifically, I want you to understand that each of these concepts has a very specific definition. And uh, in some cases, you know, I'll be watching the news, or I'll be reading a news article, and they'll kind of misuse these uh, uh, terms. And that can be kind of frustrating when you, when you know that they have a very specific definition. A little bit more about some basic concepts. So the attack rate is another term that you might have heard. So that's just the percentage of the population that contracts the disease over some specified period of time. Mortality rates are a big hot topic right now with COVID. And that's essentially the proportion of people that get a disease, you know, over the proportion or the proportion of people that die from a disease divided by the proportion of people that get a disease. And so, you know, with COVID, we're looking at, you know, something like 3% mortality rate, for example. Um, the term epidemic, pandemic, so an epidemic is kind of a, a, a smaller scale pandemic that occurs over a smaller region of uh, geography. Uh, so an epidemic would be, you know, if there were an outbreak of, uh, of, a, of cholera in, uh, in a particular region of India, for example, that would be an epidemic potentially. Um, a pandemic is a larger scale epidemic, so it scans, uh, spans kind of global uh, uh, regions. 
Um, there's a concept in epidemiology called the epidemiologic triangle, and that's that there are, uh, there's an agent, there's a host, an environment, and I kind of draw that down here in the bottom right, and they really interact with one another. And so the example that I like to think about is mosquito-borne diseases. So think malaria, right? And so the, the host would be the human in that case, the agent would be um, the, uh, you know, the, the malaria, uh, which is a, uh, it's a, it's not a virus, it's a, well, the word just escaped me. Uh, but so malaria would be the pathogen that we'd be interested in and then kind of the environment would be, you know, the mosquito and whatnot. And it could be potentially the environment itself. And there's a really interesting interplay there where the environment has to have the right conditions for mosquito growth. So there are specific precipitation conditions, there are specific temperature conditions that require, that are, that are required for mosquitoes to be able to breed. And then when mosquitoes breed, uh, there are a couple different ways that the disease, the malaria can actually be transmitted between humans and the mosquito. So an infected human, uh, if, if an uninfected mosquito bites a, a, an infected human, then the human can actually transmit the disease to the mosquito. Likewise, if an infected mosquito bites an uninfected human, then the mosquito can, can transmit uh, uh, malaria to the, uh, the human. And so there's this really interesting interplay there uh, that uh, epidemiolog epidemiologists are very interested in. Uh, and then finally, uh, causality is a big thing that, uh, that epidemiologists are interested in. So when it comes to uh, smoking, for example, or cardiovascular disease, we're often interested in, you know, not necessarily what correlates with, uh, you know, having lung cancer. We want to know what, what causes lung cancer. Right? And so if we can say that smoking definitively causes lung cancer, which is a much stronger statement than smoking is correlated with lung cancer, then that's very useful information. That requires very good, strong data uh, and often very long-term studies. Um, I won't really talk about too much more about that other than to say it's difficult, uh, but it's something that uh, epidemiologists are very interested in. All right, so I wanna talk just a little bit about how uh, classical, disease modeling works. So classical disease modeling is based off of uh, what we often call compartmental models. And so these, this is a system of differential equations. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with differential equations just yet, but these are essentially equations that allow you to uh, measure, I like to think of them as flow uh, between different, uh, uh, different things that you care about. And so what uh, this, and this is, this method of, of modeling disease has been around for decades. And so this is something that we still do uh, to this day and off, but it's, I'm gonna show you kind of a distilled, the simplest example that we typically have. And so you can think of a population, think of a population in your, in Louisville, right? So you've got Louisville, you can break up that population into different compartments, okay? And so a compartment could be uh, susceptible individuals. Those are people that are susceptible to getting a disease. There are some people that are infected with a disease, and then there are people that are uh, either recovered or they died from a disease. And so in the case of COVID, uh, you know, most of the population is susceptible. Um, some percentage of the population uh, was infected, and then some other percentage of the population, some smaller percentage, uh, either recovered from COVID and is no longer eligible, uh, you know, as long as uh, uh, antibodies do their job, or they died. And so that's what, what this uh, model kind of attempts to model, attempts to look at. And so the idea is that we have, we can flow, once you're, if you're susceptible, there is a, a rate at which people flow from the susceptible category into the infected category. So you can go from being susceptible to infected if you get exposed. And then, and then there's another rate where people will flow from the infected uh, category into the, uh, into the recovered or, rem or removed um, uh, compartment. So uh, there are rates that govern that, and we often determine those rates. We typically uh, determine those rates from data. And so if we have uh, data you know, in from, that are provided from the CDC, for example, that show us how many people get a particular disease over time, and then we see, we understand certain parameters about that disease, how long it takes you uh, to get that, you know, what, what your, uh, uh, there are, so there are some properties about disease like, uh, 
how long it takes for from the time that you get exposed to a disease to the time that you start to show symptoms, um, from, from the time that you get exposed to a disease to the time that you are infectious to other people. Uh, those, those sorts of uh, bits of information coupled with historical case counts data about how many people were sick over a period of time, ultimately we can start to, to derive this model from data. And so these are the, the equations. We're not gonna spend any time on this. I just wanna show you that there is actual math that we use to, uh, to uh, solve these problems right here. Now, this is the simplest possible uh, uh, compartmental model that we typically use. Uh, we call this the SIR model. Um, it can get quite a bit more complex. And so as an example, often what we'll do as a next step is between the, uh, the susceptible and the infected uh, compartments will introduce another compartment that sits right here that's the exposed. And so at some point, that's what allows us to account for kind of that, that uh, latent period, for example. And so you go from being susceptible to you, now you're exposed to a disease, and then ultimately uh, you can be infectious. We can also add compartments for asymptomatic cases. So you might have heard about how, you know, something like 40% of all COVID cases are asymptomatic, where people are capable of spreading the disease, but they themselves don't show any symptoms. And so you can represent that sort of thing with another compartment uh, in these models. You can solve this system of differential equations and what you get out of that is uh, a graph that looks kind of like this, where you can see how many people in a given population, here we're looking at proportions, and, but you can get a sense of how many people in a given population are in each of those compartments uh, over some period of time. Uh, this is really useful because if you're able to derive parameters from data that you care about, right, so you know the, infect the infection rate and the recovery rate and things like that, you're able to look at that from data, then you can get a sense of how bad a particular epidemic is going to be. And you can look at how that plays out kind of going forward. Uh, this gives you a rough sense of how, how that works. This SIR type model is what is kind of the foundation for most of our uh, modern uh, epidemiological modeling. All right, so what do we do? What is my group in particular interested in? So we're interested in, in improving decision support. And so decision support is, you know, people that are in positions where they can make decisions. So that's policymakers, uh, that's the CDC, that's your local government that's looking to, you know, enact like mask ordinances and, and, and should, should schools be open and closed and whatnot? And so we're interested in, can we improve, how can we improve decision support by monitoring and forecasting disease uh, using heterogeneous data streams, mathematical models, and quantifying model uncertainty. Now there's a lot to unpack there. So I wanna kind of unpack each portion of this. So I mentioned what disease, what decision support is. Monitoring and forecasting disease, that's about tracking the current status of disease, as well as looking at what disease is likely to, to do in the near future, right? And so we've spent a whole lot of time forecasting disease where we're interested in what does the next month of COVID it, uh, likely to look like in the state of Georgia or in the state of Alabama, right? Um, what does the next uh, uh, week look like in some cases? And so we often do short-term and kind of longer-term forecasts. Uh, interestingly, I'm actually working uh, on a project that's about to kick off now where we're gonna be doing climate scale uh, disease forecasting. So we're interested in coupling kind of long-term climate models that are looking at decades long forecasts of climate and, and how can we couple that with uh, models of uh, disease spread, specifically looking at mosquito-borne disease spread because we know that the mosquito life cycle is based on the climate. So we can kind of do short-term forecasts as well as long-term. Uh, I mentioned heterogeneous data streams. I'll dive more into this in a little bit, but as, uh, what this essentially means is that we're trying to use all sorts of different data streams that may be completely unrelated to one another at first glance, right? And so as an example, suppose I wanna use both Twitter data and satellite imagery to help inform a model of uh, mosquito-borne disease spread. How can I do that? That's kind of what heterogeneous uh, data streams are. I mentioned mathematical models. Mathematical models are, are kind of like the SIR type models that I just, that I just showed you, those, the, that system of differential equations. Uh, we also use statistical models, uh, and there are uh, a number of other uh, modeling methods that we've got. And then finally, uh, I say quantifying model uncertainty. So that's about 
understanding the uncertainty in your data and in your forecast. Because with any prediction of the future, you're uncertain about what that prediction is. And so what we want to do is quantify how much we're un how uncertain we actually are. And as a general rule, the further you go out in time, the more uncertain you get. I'm pretty sure we know what's going to happen with the weather tomorrow. I'm less sure about what's going to happen with the weather in 10 days. It's, it's that sort of situation. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention is that uh, although I, I, I should have included pictures and names of all the people, uh, what I'm discussing here is a massive team effort. So uh, the, the people that have contributed to this work, uh, it's a large, very multidisciplinary team. We have uh, computer scientists, we have applied mathematicians, we have statisticians, we have uh, a sociologist on the team, we have uh, people, geographers on the team, uh, kind of every field, we have physicists on the team, kind of every field of science is needed in order to do this kind of work. And once we start diving in a bit more into what the data are, I think that'll make a bit more sense. Uh, so yeah, over, overall, there have been dozens of people over a number of years that have, con that have contributed to all these different projects. Uh, I, I just want to leave you with the, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I did all this by myself, because that is absolutely not the case. So a little bit more about disease surveillance. So I talked to you about epidemiology, but how do epidemiologists actually get their data? Um, so the old way that epidemiologists, and still really the current way, is that uh, I get sick with a disease, I go to a hospital or to a doctor's office, and depending on what I get sick with, the doctor may or may not have to report that to the CDC or the local public health department. So there are, there's a set of diseases that are called reportable diseases, right? And so some of those diseases include HIV, tuberculosis, Ebola. Uh, there's a bunch of different reportable, those are mandatory reporting. So basically if any doctor sees any one of those cases, they have to report it. There are other diseases that are voluntary. Uh, and so influenza is actually a voluntary disease. Uh, unless you die from inf influenza, uh, not all uh, healthcare providers will report that to the CDC and whatnot. And so what happens is I get sick, I go to the doctor, uh, depending on what I get sick with, depending on that particular doctor, uh, the doctor may report my information uh, up the chain. And so how that works is if, I, uh, if, I, if my information is deemed reportable, then uh, that, that particular hospital or healthcare provider will kind of aggregate data, you know, maybe at the weekly level. So what, you know, so you'd see that, you know, the Los Alamos uh, Medical Center would have seen 15 cases of uh, COVID-19 or something like that. They would collect all of that data and they would do that maybe on a weekly basis, maybe on a daily basis. It kind of depends on what the disease is. And then they would send that up. They would send that up to the next level of the chain. And so they would send that up to either the county or the state. The state or the county would then aggregate all of that information and then ultimately send it on to the CDC. Um, now this, this method, it works, uh, but it's, it, it, there's a lot of resources that are involved. Uh, and typically it's costly and slow. COVID-19 is kind of the one exception where uh, we have uh, daily uh, case reports uh, coming from most places. But in general, what happens is if I go to the doctor's office and I get diagnosed with influenza and that gets reported, effectively, when I go check the CDC's website, my information won't be reported on the CDC's website until about two to three weeks later. And so uh, kind of looking at that from a different lens, if I'm kind of a data scientist and I want to get the most recent information I can, I go to the CDC's website and I pull the data from the CDC. What I'm looking at are data representing the current state of things from like two or three weeks ago. In other words, I don't actually know what's going on right now. And so what we've been working on, a lot of what we've been working on is how to close that gap of two to three weeks uh, in the reporting lag. And then uh, also, uh, how can we kind of be better and smarter about how we do this disease surveillance? So our approach has been that we, there are all sorts of different data streams, many of which are available kind of in real time all over the world on the internet. Uh, they are large in some cases. They are very noisy data in some cases. Um, but if we are smart about how we gather those data and how we process them, and we put those into the appropriate mathematical and statistical models, then we can all of a sudden derive probabilistic forecasts. And the, the, the thinking here is that this is 
this is how the weather community has done this for decades, right? And so how the, the weather forecasting community does this is the weather forecasting community has data coming from all over the world. There are ground stations, there are satellites that provide data. Ground stations can go offline at any time because you know an animal can knock it over or a battery can die. Um, the, if there's a satellite uh, that, that is capturing weather data on the ground, that satellite could have its view occluded by clouds, so it can't actually get data for, for that per particular period of that, that particular uh, flyover. And so, uh, and you know, new weather stations can come online, uh, old weather stations can go offline. And so uh, then what the weather community does is it'll take all of that data, it will throw it into physical models of, of how uh, we know that winds move throughout, uh, you know, in a, in a particular region, for example. Um, and, uh, and then you can start to understand what the weather patterns are likely to be going forward. And so that's kind of where we got our inspiration from. Um, so we started off a while back. Um, uh, one of the projects that I worked on was uh, forecasting disease with Wikipedia data. And so for that, we were using um, uh, historical clinical surveillance data, and we were using Wikipedia data. Uh, what we got out of Wikipedia actually is uh, accesses. And so this is every time you visit, you know, the influenza page on Wikipedia or the COVID-19 page on Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia uh, registers that as a hit, and then uh, in uh, in turn, Wikipedia will actually publish those, those accesses uh, through time. And so what we have is per hour, per article on Wikipedia, we know how many people read each article. And what we were interested in was how well does people accessing specific articles related to disease correlate with that actual disease, right? And so the idea is that if you're visiting the COVID-19 page or if you're visiting the influenza page, some proportion of those people may actually have COVID-19 and they're, they're trying to read more about it. They're trying to get information on the symptoms. Or maybe uh, it's, it's the peak of the flu season and you think you might have the flu. And so you wanna read more about therapeutics for flu, right? You wanna understand what kinds of uh, drugs are available and how the tests work and things like that. And so what we were doing is we were capturing all of those different time series. We would throw those into statistical and mathematical models. And then that would in turn give us uh, forecasts uh, with uncertainty here. And so what I'm showing here is uh, kind of historical uh, uh, influenza curves. So each one of these gray lines, these are all historical influenza seasons. Uh, this, uh, the, the, the blue dots that are along here, these are uh, previous uh, uh, case counts that we've got out of, you know, CDC data, for example, and then uh, these these stars, these are forecasted values. This is kind of the median for oh, these these actual for actual values. These this is our kind of forecast right here, and then this gray band is our uncertainty with the forecast. And so that's this is kind of a, a nice way to get started with um, what we've been doing. Um, Let's see, I talk about Wikipedia. So one of the, how we did this was, uh, I kind of just described a bit, but Wikipedia is available in 30 million uh, uh, articles. Uh, so there are 287 different languages that Wikipedia is in. Uh, and it is, uh, at least the last time I checked, and that might be different now, but it was the sixth most popular website on the internet. Uh, and interestingly, it's the first most popular website on the internet that's not either a search engine or a social media site. Um, and like I said, we have historical accesses to all of these different articles going back to 2007, and they were available on an hourly basis. Um, and so what we were using was essentially these time series of accesses uh, to these articles. And so as an example, this is just a screenshot, an older screenshot from the influenza article. There are all these blue links here. And so all of these links, what we would do is we would go to the root influenza article, for example, we would gather up all of the different links that are here and we'd say, well, okay, all of these sites, uh, are all of these other articles that are linked here are in some way related to influenza. And so let's capture all of the time series for each one of these, and then we'll use that to build our model. Um, and so here are some of the results that we got out of that. And so, you, so what I show here in blue on each one of these, those are the actual cases. In red is our model. And then kind of in the background is some of the 
uh, the actual raw Wikipedia uh, data here. And so what you can see is that, you know, in some cases we were doing quite well. So dengue is a mosquito-borne disease. We were looking at dengue in Brazil. We capture the trend here quite nicely. There's a lot of individual variability on any given week or month, uh, but we capture the trend pretty nicely. Influenza in Poland, same sort of thing. In fact, we capture this big spike really cleanly. And if you look at how the kind of the influenza uh, uh, grade lines here are, there's, there's a big spike kind of simultaneously in all of the influenza articles that we're looking at, which is why we're able to do that. Similarly, we had really nice results with influenza in the United States and even tuberculosis in China. Um, tuberculosis is kind of an oddball disease for forecasting because uh, people get tuberculosis and often have it for a very long period of time. The incubation period can be uh, quite a while as well, but even still, uh, we were able to track it uh, quite nicely. Uh, there were some failures. We wanted to understand where this doesn't work. Um, so you can see um, Ebola in Uganda is actually kind of an interesting one. So this was uh, an outbreak that occurred back in mid-2012. Um, there were very few cases in total. We were looking at, uh, I think it was something like 80 or 90 cases. Um, and so we didn't really expect this to work, but we were just kind of curious. So we threw the, the data at the model. Uh, you can see that there's kind of this interesting uh, uh, background noise that's consistently up here in one of the Wikipedia articles. So this is the root, this is the Ebola article on Wikipedia. And actually, in fact, if you zoom in, you see something kind of interesting, which is during the, during the workday, the, the accesses tend to be very high. And then on weekends, it's quite low. And our hypothesis is that people are just bored at work and they just are looking up Ebola and other interesting you know, diseases and things like that because they just end up kind of in a Wikipedia rabbit hole uh, that I'm sure we've all done uh, before. Um, okay, so this was kind of uh, some of our first work incorporating, um, incorporating uh, what we call social internet data into models of disease spread. Um, so we've also used uh, Google Trends data. And so Google has a really nice data set where you can go and you can see how many people over time are searching for specific keywords on Google. And uh, so uh, here the intuition is that if I'm searching for influenza or for cough or for fever or for flu symptoms or something on Google, then if I pick up the time series, you know, how many people are looking up those things over time in some region, well, then maybe that correlates with actual influenza, for example. And so we did essentially the same sort of thing we did with Wikipedia, except we did it here uh, using Google data. And it works uh, similarly. Uh, and the reason it works similarly is because most people will um, uh, use Google in order to arrive ultimately at Wikipedia. And so they're, they're, kind of, they're kind of related there. One of the nice things that drove us to Wikipedia uh, over Google is the fact that Wikipedia is completely open data. Right, so Google's data, it's all proprietary. At any given time, Google could shut down uh, you know, Google Trends, and so we wouldn't be able to get that data anymore. But uh, you know, Wikipedia's entire business model is the openness of data. And so the availability of that data is really attractive for, for building models like this. Um, we have been participating. So the CDC uh, since 2013 has run an influenza prediction uh, forecasting uh, challenge. And we've been a part of that since it started. Um, and so how the, how the challenge works is starting in late October, uh, we, we submit weekly forecasts to the CDC. And we're trying to forecast things um, like what is the, when is the peak likely to be? Uh, for influenza. We're trying to do this at, you know, kind of regional levels. So when is it likely to be? Uh, how many people are likely to get sick? How long is the entire uh, influenza, uh, uh, you know, season likely to be for this particular year and so on and so forth. Um, so we use uh, Google search queries for that, historical uh, clinical surveillance data. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to go into specifics in the models other than to say it's a statistical model uh, that uh, incorporates the SIR type model that I was just talking about uh, about 10 or 15 minutes ago. And so we're kind of combining statistical models with that SIR type model and with Google data. And so when kind of putting all those things together, we're able to create some really nice forecasts of influenza. Um, 
So looking uh, here, so what you see is um, uh, on the right hand side here, this is kind of how our model for the 27, 2018 influenza uh, season kind of played out. Um, so what we have here in the gray, these are historical seasons of influenza. So we've got, you know, a couple decades worth of those. Um, then what you see in the black is uh, these are new data that are reported on a weekly basis by the CDC. And you see in the gray, uh, uh, the gray bounds here, these, this is our uncertainty. And then you can see here in kind of the, um, uh, let's see, I'm a little skew when this starts back up again. So what you can see here is kind of our, how our forecast kind of plays out. And you can see that as the CDC provides more data to us, our uncertainty bounds, in other words, this gray region right here, shrinks. And that's because as we get more data, we become more and more confident in our uh, forecasts. Um, uh, notably, uh, our model actually placed first, and in fact, uh, it actually placed first and second because we submitted two different models. And then uh, the third model was an ensemble model and we accounted for something like 80% of the ensemble in that ensemble model. So, so we effectively took first, second, and third place uh, in this. And we're competing against groups coming out of Harvard, MIT, uh, Columbia, and, and a lot of the other big name schools that are doing um, uh, disease forecasting. So this was, this was a, a quite an honor. Um, one other thing we can do is we can actually compare uh, models that contain internet data against models that don't contain internet data. And so as, as an example here, uh, if we include uh, Wikipedia data in our forecast, uh, you can see that our forecast actually tracks kind of better than uh, were we not to include the data. Uh, so that, that's kind of nice. So internet data not only increases accuracy, but also reduces uncertainty. And so, oh, oh sorry, I'm, I missed these up. So this is, this bottom one is the forecast with the internet data, with the Wikipedia data. This top one is the forecast without it. And here you see the open circles. Those are what the actual data points ended up looking like. And uh, what you see here in the dark line, this is what our forecast uh, looks like. And so if we forecast without Wikipedia data, we think at this point that our forecast is just going to continue to increase and then eventually it'll dip. Whereas in reality, the Wikipedia data told us, no, there's actually in, uh, reduced interest in influenza. So we're going to pull that model forecast down a bit, which ended up being more correct. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to spend some, most of the rest of the time talking about uh, modeling dengue in Brazil. So I mentioned dengue earlier. So dengue is a mosquito-borne uh, virus. It's prevalent in many parts of the world uh, that are tropical in nature, including uh, Thailand, Brazil, much of Southeast Asia. Um, symptoms include high fever, vomiting, muscles, joint pain, rash. It's very similar uh, to influenza. In fact, kind of a running joke among epidemiologists is that everything looks like influenza until it's not. Um, so some small proportion of cases develop this, what's called dengue hemorrhagic fever, which is kind of like the hemorrhagic fever that you might be aware of uh, that occurs with Ebola. It's particularly nasty. Um, in general, mortality rates are quite low. So fewer than 1% than of people that get dengue die from it. Um, however, there is a, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a strong economic burden to, to dengue, which is, you know, 50 to 100 million people are infected globally per year. And because the symptoms are so horrible, in fact, uh, this disease is often called the bone break disease. Uh, and that's because it, it hurts you, your joints hurt so bad that it feels like you've broken your bones. It's just this horrible pain. And so while people are infected with, with dengue and they're experiencing the symptoms, they can't really go to work. And so there's this big economic cost to it. Unfortunately, there's no vaccine or no treatment available other than preventative measures, such as uh, bed nets, which prevent mosquitoes from biting you and spraying for mosquitoes. And so as a result, because, because these only, only preventative measures are useful, if we can forecast where dengue is likely to be bad, then we can be, pro we can be proactive about going out and spraying for mosquitoes and hopefully killing them off. So how did we do our uh, forecasting? So what we did, this starts to get again at the heterogeneous data fusion that I was talking about. So we're combining five different data streams here. We're combining clinical surveillance data, which is historical dengue counts. We're combining, we're looking at satellite imagery. We're like looking at climate, like weather data. We got demographic data and then Google search queries. And the reason we're combining all five of these is because 
understanding the true complexity of dengue is actually quite challenging. And so what we, what we want to do is kind of get at the human component and the mosquito component. And we need a lot of different data streams to kind of do that for us. So clinical surveillance data tells us uh, you know, where humans are getting uh, dengue, where, where they're getting it and, and when. Um, satellite imagery and climate data start to get at the mosquito breeding grounds, the mosquito habitats, right? And so if we can look at satellite imagery and we can, we can look at climate data, and we can see standing bodies of water or regions where there's rain, we can look at the temperature ranges and we can see that it's likely uh, the right, the right um, conditions for mosquito breeding, uh, then that's really useful to us because that gives us insight into the mosquito life cycle. Um, we look at demographic data, we can look at Google search queries, and this again gets to the human component. And so with demographic data, we can look at um, where people have good running water, for example, uh, where there's good sewage systems, for example. This comes from the Brazil census data. Um, and where you have better uh, access to running water and good high quality sewage systems, that's, that's, uh, that will help reduce the uh, places where mosquitoes are likely to be able to thrive. And so uh, we, we, we combine all of these data streams into predictive models. We're doing this at the municipality level in Brazil. And so think uh, county level here in the United States. So we're, we're essentially combining all of these data into individual county level models across the entirety of Brazil. Um, Brazil is a very large country. It's the fifth largest country by landmass. And so uh, this, this is a whole lot of data. Uh, just the satellite imagery alone, we're looking at uh, nearly 30 terabytes worth of imagery over the, over the, the seven year period that we actually cared about. So it's a whole lot of data. Uh, just combining these data and uh, putting those into a model, uh, that was probably about 90 to 95% of the work right there. Uh, and then once, you're, once you have the data in a place where you can uh, feed them into a model, then the modeling uh, often falls out. And that's kind of the plight of a data scientist is dealing with data, data wrangling is often you know 80 to 90% of the task. Uh, the modeling is kind of that last little bit. It's often uh, pretty easy once you get to that point. Um, and then finally, I want to finish up with uh, some more recent stuff that we've done for COVID. And so we have a website here. You can, you can all visit this link uh, if you want. It's publicly accessible. And so this is uh, where we've been providing our uh, COVID-19 forecasts. And, and so we have forecasts uh, for uh, every state in the United States, plus DC, plus Puerto Rico. Uh, and the Virgin Islands. And then also uh, we have forecasts for every country uh, that's experiencing COVID. And so what we're forecasting is uh, how many cases are we going to see over the next uh, week, over the next six weeks, we're forecasting out to six weeks, and then also how many deaths are we likely to see. And the reason this is useful is because it enables, um, it enables public health people to plan. And so, in fact, we've been working very closely with the uh, New Mexico governor and the New Mexico Department of Health, and they're using our forecast in order to determine, uh, you know, should we en enact more strict uh, uh, guidelines or, you know, more strict uh, closures and things like that, or is everything kind of trending in the right way and we're, we're probably okay to start reopening some things. And so that's kind of what we uh, provide here. I mentioned, uh, you know, how important uncertainty is. And so what you see here, these are uncertainty bands. And in this table, likewise, uh, you see kind of the median here, but we also show you kind of what the best case looks like, kind of this lower bound and also kind of the, the worst case, which would be this upper bound right here. There's a whole lot of information that's on our website that I have not uh, screenshot here, but I definitely encourage you to go play around with it. Um, we, um, this was a little bit different for us. We often are, you know, in research, you often develop something, uh, you write a paper and you publish that paper and then you're on to the next thing. Uh, this was a little bit different where we were kind of leveraging some of the techniques that we've built over the last, uh, you know, five or six years, especially. And we actually, we have this running, we have, uh, we're producing forecasts every single night on, on using one of the supercomputers that we have. And then um, uh, we publish those every Monday and every Thursday uh, to the public. And we're submitting these also to the CDC. Um, uh, we were among the first four groups uh, to submit forecasts of COVID to, uh, to the CDC. And it's been, we've had a really nice reaction um, to, to this work. Um, let's see. 
And then I've got some backup slides on some stuff that's kind of fun to talk about, but I'm not going to dive into that. I figure we can kind of just talk about uh, whatever questions that you guys have. Um, so I hope, I hope that that's good. I hope it wasn't too quick. Uh, if you want clarification on anything, please let me know and I'm happy to clarify or exp expand a bit more. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we've got a few questions from the chat, so I'll um, pose them to you. Um, first of all, you've talked a lot about a lot of different models tonight. Are, is the source code public for any of those? Good question. Or, um, or open source? So our Wikipedia source code is open sourced. Uh, in fact, we had, there was a university out of Alabama, I think, that noticed a slight bug in our code. Uh, and, and this was after the paper was published. It didn't affect the results or anything, but, but that was kind of cool. There was a class uh, in, at a university in, I believe, Alabama that was using our code um, and kind of taking it and modifying it and hopefully improving it. So that was kind of neat. Um, outside of that, we are going to be open sourcing our COVID forecasting uh, stuff. Uh, but we have that that kind of, so here at Lanel, there's kind of a whole process for open sourcing code. It's like a six month process and uh, it's kind of a pain. And uh, we're actually uh, nearly done with the paper right now that describes the mo the methods for, for our COVID forecasting. And uh, we will likely publish our code at the same time that we, that we publish the paper. Um, so, okay. and I'm happy to provide a link to the, the GitLab, the, uh, this one's on GitHub for our, um, our Wikipedia stuff. Okay, yeah, if you could share that with me, I can make sure it gets distributed. Sounds good. Um, so uh, a COVID question that you might know the answer to, um, do the mortality rates of, of COVID differ much from locality to locality in the U.S.? Uh, you know, maybe it's more deadly in, in some states than others? Uh, so the answer is yes. It absolutely has been more deadly in some places and less deadly in others. Um, an example of that would be um, so if once you, so, uh, oh, there's a term for this and I just lost it. Um, Jeff, maybe you'll, maybe you'll remember, but there's a, there's a term for when you look at aggregate statistics. And then when you look at kind of, when you kind of zoom in and you de, uh, aggregate, you de-aggregate those statistics and you can find all sorts of potentially conflicting, um, it's, it's the Simpson Simpsons paradox. paradox. Yeah. Simpsons paradox. Mm -hmm. And so Simpsons paradox plays out very nicely here actually. And so, uh, you know, at the aggregate level, uh, you, you see one thing, but then when you zoom in to, you know, it, even county level, uh, there are vast differences and they can sometimes um, really uh, contradict one another. You know, an example, a perfect example is looking at, you know, kind of uh, New York City. New York City obviously had the worst go of COVID back in April. Um, so the mortality rate there was, was quite high. You look at some rural areas, especially, you look at, you know, Wyoming or one of the Dakotas or Alaska, uh, and you'll get a, a very different picture of, of what COVID looked like there. So co co what, what we would say is that COVID has a very heterogeneous presence uh, across uh, geographies, right? So some, some countries have experienced it worse than other countries. Within a country, different regions will experience it differently. And that's largely due to, it's largely a function of population density, it's a function of the response, uh, the public health response uh, in that region. Uh, and uh, it can be uh, quite difficult to actually account for all of those things in a model. Hey, Jeff, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. This is, uh, this is Chris Lober. I'm uh, the teacher at DuPont Manual. One of the, I actually posed the question because if we look at our state of Kentucky, we have just over 50,000 confirmed positive cases and just over a thousand deaths. So if you did your basic proportion, that's about 2% mortality rate, yep. which I'm pretty sure that it's not that high because we have had trouble with testing. And so I'm sure that there is not equal testing from state to state. And so how might that play out? And, and how is that even discussed from one local um, newspaper to another per se, <laughs> in terms of how that is occurring, so. I mean, you ask a really, really good, important question. I mean, this is kind of, and this is not unique to COVID. Uh, so one of the challenges is that, so there's a, um, there's a concept in, in epidemiology called the case definition. And the case definition is exactly how you define a case to be one particular disease, right? And so uh, with, 
Influenza, there's a specific case definition for uh, what we call influenza-like illness, which is you have to have a fever over 101, you have to have a cough, you have to have a sore throat. There, there's some, basically you have to check a bunch of boxes. And once you check those boxes, then you are diagnosed with that particular disease. Um, I'm simplifying things here a bit, but you get the idea. Um, the, the, one of the challenges in epidemiology is that the case definition itself can change over time. Uh, and in fact, the COVID case definition has changed over time, uh, kind of as we've learned more about it, as we've uh, gotten better at testing things, for example, like there's kind of how we diagnose uh, COVID has kind of changed over time and it's changed regionally too, which is kind of a pain. And so that makes it uh, kind of difficult. Ebola has experienced that same sort of thing um, where during, you know, just even during an outbreak, the case definition can change. Testing, um, testing methods can change. How you choose the people to test can change. And in fact, we're encountering that right now with COVID. You've probably heard how the CDC's guidelines have changed in some ways. And so if the CDC's guidelines or if local public health guidelines change and you're not testing in the same way that you were testing before, it makes it very difficult to make comparisons uh, uh, you know, across time. Um, so that's, it's just, it's something that we constantly deal with. Often, honestly, what we do is we try and just ignore it when it comes to data science. We just throw it at the model. And if the model does funky things, we say, note here, the reason for this funky thing is because the case reporting requirements changed or the testing methodology changed. And so uh, it, it's really, really difficult to account for those sorts of things. And I like the fact that you've highlighted the major difference in terms of when we typically introduce and study models, with very limited variables versus reality when you have multivariate realities. Yeah, so. yeah, reality is is never as clean as it is uh, in a in a uh, structured like school scenario, unfortunately. Jeff, I got a two part question uh, coming from me actually. Mm -hmm. um, are you participating in the influenza modeling again this year? Uh, yes, so we've done that every year since 2013, and we'll be doing it again this year. So um, how do you anticipate that uh, coronavirus precautions such as wearing masks, more social distancing, lack of people spending time in public spaces is going to impact your modeling this year? That's an excellent question. Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. I don't have any strong thoughts on it, but I can kind of riff and, and maybe you can get a sense of where my thoughts are. Um, my guess is that we will see fewer influenza cases kind of across the board as a general rule, simply because people are already, uh, number one, they're physically distancing, which is the most important thing you can do to avoid COVID. And number two, people are wearing masks. They aren't going into work. Uh, there are just gonna be fewer um, you know, human human interactions uh, over the next you know, influenza season. And as a result, we're likely to see many fewer uh, cases this year. Um, now, how, as to how that impacts our modeling, I am not entirely sure. Uh, I think it depends on how much that, that difference in magnitude between what this next flu season looks like and what previous flu seasons have looked like actually is. I mean, if we're talking an order of 50% reduction or something like that, I don't know what's actually reasonable, but, it, but if hypothetically it's a 50% reduction, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that will impact the models. It could be that the models overestimate things um, kind of across the board. It could, what's probably likely is that the models will initially overestimate. And then as we get more data, the models will kind of figure out that this is a less severe flu season. I mean, we have plenty of historical flu seasons that haven't been that bad. We've got a handful of flu seasons that were really bad. Uh, and my guess is that the model will, uh, the model will at some point figure out that we are trending more towards the flu seasons that are less severe. Uh, but uh, it's, it's really hard to say. And I, I'm kind of excited to see how it plays out, honestly, because I don't know. And there'll be some, as, as uh, what Chris just asked, there will definitely be some uh, uh, geographic differences uh, that'll be interesting to see how they play out. So I know, I know we're over time, but do you have a few more minutes for a couple yeah, of questions? That's right. yeah. yeah. So, um, one question that just came in, and it's, can you make any kind of comparison this year um, in your in your modeling of COVID and influenza? Do you think those models will uh, trend similarly, or do you think you'll be able to use information from one model for the other? So the answer is probably no. Um, it's something we've talked about. Uh, it's a it's a really important question to ask, but COVID has some. 
um, uh, some some kind of key differences from how uh, influenza typically plays out. And so we so when we first built our COVID model, uh, one of the questions was, you know, kind of can we use historical influenza influenza uh, season data in order to seed a model of COVID? We ultimately decided against it. Uh, it would have been nice if we could do that because if we could do that, that would have simplified and gave us much better uh, data. However, uh, we don't yet have any reason to believe that uh, COVID is seasonal. So influenza in pretty much all cases is a seasonal disease, right? And so it picks up, it, it kind of kicks off in October, November or so, and then it typically ends in May. Uh, you, I mean, there are cases of influenza that occur during summers, but they're very few and far between. Uh, and it, it's enough that nobody in the public health community is really concerned about it. So if we attempted to use uh, a model that was trained on influenza data for COVID, it would almost certainly uh, give us the false impression or what we believe currently is the false impression that COVID would be a seasonal disease. And since we don't yet have evidence to, uh, to believe that COVID is a seasonal disease, uh, we don't really want to deal with that sort of uh, data yet. And then one last question, um, just so we don't take up your whole evening. <laughs> sure. um, so we gave a um, a lecture series this summer about a lot of different uh, machine learning algorithms. Yeah. Um, so students have heard of things like um, regression and classification. Um, right a little bit about neural networks. Can you right. talk about how any of those ideas just on a high level might play into what you're doing here? Sure, um, so there's some work that I did not present here. In fact, there's a whole bunch of work that I didn't present here that I would have loved to have presented. So uh, we have, um, so in most of the work that I just presented, we're using either the SIR type models, which is the mathematical models based on ordinary di differential equations, or we're using statistical models. The statistical models are typically uh, reliant on some sort of Bayesian model, uh, which you might have heard of a Bayes net. A Bayes net is kind of related to a, to a Bayesian uh, regression model. Um, and uh, we also use linear regression, for example. We have, there's a bunch of different ways that you can build a linear regression model. And we've used pretty much all of them, ranging from lasso to elastic net to classic uh, ordinary least squares. So, uh, we, we play with those a lot. Uh, the data for, uh, for, case, for case counts is often represented using what's called a Poisson uh, distribution. And there's, there's kind of regression methods that are based off of that uh, that you can use. And that's because uh, Poisson uh, regression methods are based off of, uh, of counts, right? And so you have one or two or three, you don't have one and a half or one and a quarter of something. And so those count models are often based on Poisson. So that's, that's that. Uh, there's a bunch of work here that I didn't talk about where we're using uh, classification models. Like we've used uh, a lot of text-based models for some work that we're doing right now on trying to understand COVID misinformation uh, on the internet. And so can we classify, for example, a tweet coming from some arbitrary person as containing misinformation or not? Right. Uh, this is a really difficult problem, but it's a really important problem that I think uh, many of you have probably seen in your social media. You know, how can you trust that somebody's not intentionally putting false information out there? Uh, and so, uh, for that, what we've done is we've collected a whole bunch of tweets, uh, a whole bunch of Reddit posts, and uh, we have. Uh, 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 some tools to help us annotate those as containing misinformation or not. And then we can classify those furthermore as containing different classes of misinformation. And so there are, uh, there are misinformation that's kind of intentionally misinformation. We can classify misinformation into different categories based on the type of misinformation it contains. And so as an example, there are all sorts of different conspiracy theories out there. There are conspiracy theories about how uh, COVID originated in a U.S. Uh, you know, government funded laboratory. There are conspiracy theories about how, um, uh, you know, the hydroxychloroquine stuff, you know, there's all sorts of fun stuff out there. And so we can kind of bend those different uh, social media posts into those buckets. And then we train, you know, a random forest or a neural net or something on those um, in order to classify uh, the, the tweets that we have or the Reddit posts that we have. 
Uh, we've had actually a decent amount of success with that. And it's been um, really fun work. We're very close to submitting a paper on it. Uh, and I'm not sure if we're gonna, we're gonna open source the code for that, but you'll at least be able to read a paper if you're interested. Um, for, uh, in an, another context, we built a, uh, a random forest classifier that was looking at um, classifying a particular region of the, of the world, like a country, as containing a reemergence of a disease. And so an example of this is that you might be aware that in some parts of the world, measles was, uh, you know, trending very closely to, to zero uh, for, you know, until the kind of the early, nine, uh, early 2000s or so. And then there was this anti-vaccination um, kind of scare that you probably have heard about. Uh, and the whole anti-vaccination movement has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And as a result, measles has had kind of a reemergence in many parts of the world. And so what we've built was a classifier to kind of detect uh, whether or not a particular disease is, is reemerging. Uh, and so that includes uh, all sorts of features uh, coming from data streams, uh, you know, about uh, uh, weather, it includes features on economic uh, uh, conditions of a, of a particular region through time, uh, it'll, it'll include uh, historical disease uh, features and so on and so forth. And again, the idea is basically to say that, you know, a particular region of the world looks to be experiencing a reemergence of a disease that we thought we were, were kind of on the downtrend on. So it's something that uh, we should, you know, kind of alert the public health community about. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd love to keep asking you questions all night, but it's uh, it's getting late here, and I know you're probably uh, getting ready for dinner, so we'll let you go. We thank you very much. Um, Shraman, did you want to say anything as we left? On behalf of the, this whole uh, community, AI, and Deepom, you know, we would uh, we extremely enjoyed it. It was really interesting. I learned a lot of new things that I wouldn't have if I didn't attend this and thank you for this really sure. yeah my pleasure i'm glad that uh you guys enjoyed it uh uh jeff has my contact information so if any of you guys want to follow up via email or get more information about los alamos or whatnot um this is uh some really fun work and uh if i could talk more about it uh and we had another i could easily talk <laughs> for another hour or two on this stuff it's a ton of fun all right. Well, maybe sometime uh, in the spring when you're not too busy, we'll uh, maybe at the end of flu season, we'll try to schedule you for another talk. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for everybody who attended. Yeah. Thank you, guys.